they're staring at me and I'm staring at them. And I walk in the house and I'm leaving all over the floor. And his sister said to his mother, you need to go get his mother. And my best friend's mother said, no, don't tell her. She'll sue us for everything we have. <laughs> So I'm standing there with these adults arguing amongst themselves, what are they going to do with this little five-year-old who's bleeding profusely all over their uh, floor? And I can remember, don't get my mother. Don't get my mother. Because she's going to be so upset because I heard her voice in my head and I didn't listen to her. And eventually one of them ran down. And you know what they did? They got my mother. <laughs> my mother came up and I looked at her. And it was funny because I was expecting a, a completely different reaction from her. I was expecting her to be really upset. But when she saw me, she ran over to me, she grabbed me, she hugged me, and told me I'd be alright. But they had to get an ambulance. You ever ride an ambulance? No. So this is like back in 19, probably 65. Ambulances back then looked like dinosaurs. They were huge. And I can remember riding an ambulance. And, and it was so cool because we got to run every red light. Get to the hospital. And I was in the hospital for probably uh, almost two weeks. I had to have plastic surgery. Didn't even know that. But that was. Okay? Um, but from that point on, when my mother told me not to do something, like with a dog, I listened to what she said. Because after that, there was a dog that lived next door to him. His name was Blackie. The other dog was named Charlie. Now, see, I was used to Charlie because Charlie was a great dog. Charlie, the owner, used to dress him up uh, on holidays. One, one day, he was dressed up as a sheriff so he could walk on his back legs. He was wearing a, a gun belt with a gun on the side, a sheriff's hat, and a badge on his vest. So I liked him, and I thought this other dog was like but it wasn't. But anyway, like I said, as you grow up, your mom, your dad are going to be telling you, do this, don't do that. Your grandparents are going to be telling you, do this, don't do that. Your teachers are going to be telling you that. And then you know what? You get to be adults, and there are still people telling you, do this, don't do that. Right? Yeah. There's never a point in your life until you die where somebody's not telling you what to do. So God made it that way. Number one, to keep us out of trouble. You as young people, to help you to grow up so that you don't get hurt. Don't do bad things. Don't get in trouble. And help you to become good, productive citizens. Now, from that point, like I said, I listened to my mother on certain things that I knew were really dangerous. But as I got older, that voice kind of disappeared in my head. So I had to learn new lessons all over again. So I'm going to tell you guys now, so you don't have to repeat those same lessons, that listen to your mom and dad, listen to your grandparents, listen to your grandparents, listen to your teachers, okay? Because all they want is the best for you. Is that right? Amen. They want to help you to be able to grow up to be healthy, happy, and scarless. <laughs> Heavenly Father, thank you so much for this day, for the opportunity to talk with these young people. I pray that you bless them. I pray that you touch them with your Holy Spirit, that you guide and direct their lives. For this we ask and pray in Jesus' name. Amen.
can have happiness in the Lord. We have to choose it, though. And we have to choose to serve the Lord. If we do choose that, the happiness comes along with it. So that's what this song's about. Mm -hmm. God's Word. 
Why? Because the Spirit is living and working in them and showing them what is right and what is wrong. We have a word for that. It's called conscience, right? That our conscience talks to us. And so Paul is making a statement that when, in his day, a Gentile or a heathen actually did the righteous things contained in the law, it wasn't him doing it, but it was the Spirit of God working in him and through him that allowed him to do those things. And that in the eyes of God, that made him a child of God. So he was of the true circumcision. So we look at that and we go, well, you know, that's great for his day, but we've heard this stuff over and over and over and over and over again. But as we go on this morning, I want you to think about some of the things that you're going to hear and how they apply to our day. Because Satan is, if anything, crafty and smart. And as was brought out in the Sabbath school today, he will arrange his deceptions to fit the culture of his day. And in our day, the deceptions that he is using, got to admit, work very well. Especially within the church and within God's professed people. So verse 26 we read that. Let's look at verse 27. And will not the physically uncircumcised, if he fulfills the law, judge you who, even with your written code and circumcision, are a transgressor of the law? For he is not a Jew who is one outwardly, nor is circumcision that which is outward in the flesh. But he is a Jew who is one inwardly, and circumcision is that of the heart, in the spirit, not in the letter, whose praise is not from men, but from God. So in those sets of verses, Paul is focusing on a problem within the church today. And it is a very real, very powerful, and very bad problem. And that's the problem of hypocrisy. Pretending to be one thing when you're actually another and this is what Paul is getting at in these sets of verses. In his day, the Jews thought that they had a right to approach God. They thought that they had a true relationship with God. But it was all outward show. Paul was trying to get them to understand what Jesus was preaching and that was that God has always looked at the what? Heart. The heart. What does that mean? He wants to make sure that all your valves are working, that there's no clogs in there? No. Okay, now we need to realize this. That the Bible uses the word heart. But does the heart make you think? Does the heart decide your emotion? What is it that does that? That three pounds of stuff sitting up here, right? We in Western society have gotten really good at compartmentalizing everything. And so we can compartmentalize what goes on up here and what goes on down here. When actually, it's all about what goes on up here, right? Because this is the seat of everything you think, everything you do, and who you are. It's all up here in the mind. So when you hear that the devil and God are fighting, and they're fighting for your what? Your soul. And it starts where? In your mind. This is why it is so important that you watch and be careful with what you see, what you hear, the people you hang around, because everything has an influence on you. Is that right? Yes. And it doesn't matter whether you're your age, or my age, or your husband's age. Everything that you see, you hear, you look at, you touch, you eat, is going to have an influence on your mind. 
and God and the devil are working to gain supremacy of your mind. And so in Paul's day, with the Jews, there was a big problem of hypocrisy. Christ pointed this out in his day before they nailed him to the cross. Christ was trying to show the religious leaders that God does not care about your outward show. What God cares about is what's inside of you. We say inside your heart. It's actually what's inside your mind. And this battle, this great controversy that goes on every day is the battle that goes on inside your head. Have you guys ever, anybody here ever had to deal with mentally... Um, I had the word, I lost the word. People that are crazy. <laughs> Raise your hand if you deal if you have to deal with or you deal with. Catherine, I know you deal with some crazy people. I've had that privilege of dealing with, with mentally unstable and downright crazy people. And it's one of the hardest things that you'll ever do. The mind is a great blessing. It's an unbelievable creation of God. But Satan can damage it and do things to it that you just shake your head and go, I don't know what to do with this. I don't know what to do about this. Brothers and sisters, those issues are things that are flesh and blood that you deal with every day. There are people who come to the church that have to deal with these kind of issues. And it's not easy. This battle for the mind is the hardest, toughest battle you will ever fight. And this is why understanding the Word of God is so important. Because if you can fill your head and fill your mind with positive, godly words to help you understand this battle. How many of you ever suffer from depression? Anybody here? Again, God is a God of healing. God is a God of restoration. And Paul lays out the case in chapters 1 and 2, and he continues on in chapter 3, about the human condition. And he tells us exactly what we are. And it's not a good picture that he paints. That we are a race that needs healing, that needs restoration, that needs a rebirth. And the question is, is how do we get that? The Bible tells us that that only comes through a relationship with Jesus Christ. What has happened is that Christ came, he lived out this gospel message, the apostles came, they lived out the teachings of Christ, they passed those teachings on, and then hundreds and then thousands of years have passed and we come to our day today. And it's brought out in our Sabbath school class today, in the Protestant churches today, there are how many Gospels? Seven. At least 70? Is Bible study really important? Yes. Why? Because if there are 70 different versions of the Gospel within the Protestant churches, how can you separate the true from the counterfeit? If you worked for the Department of the Treasury and your job was to find counterfeit bills, <coughs> how do they train you? Do they show you 10,000 different counterfeit bills? Do you know what you do? You study the real one. And you study it and you study it and you study it so you know the real one so well that you're able to actually see difference between a real and a counterfeit. And it's the same thing with the gospel. This is why it is so important for you as individuals, children of the Most High God, 
to study the Bible for yourself. As a pastor, I can bring this message to you. Lester can bring a message to you. Chuck can bring a message to you. We do the study to bring you the message, but it's your responsibility after that to feed yourself. Because how many of you can live eating one day a week? Raise your hand. Nobody raise their hand, right? Okay. So, as we continue on in this, what Paul is laying the case for is the difference between the truth and the counterfeit. What God really looks at, what's the true gospel, who the true believers are, and then the false. And he focuses here on the right of circumcision. Turn with me to Romans chapter 4. Let's look at verses 1 and 2. What then shall we say that Abraham our father has found according to the flesh? For if Abraham was justified by works, then he has something to boast about, but not before God. Verse 3, for what does the scripture say? And the scripture says that Abraham what? Believed, Believed God, and it was what? Accounted to him for righteousness. righteousness. How was it accounted to him as righteousness? What did that mean? God made Abraham a promise, right? Promise that his descendants would be as many as the stars in the sky. It makes him another promise saying that his descendants would be more than the sands of the sea. Is that a lot of descendants? Yeah. At that time, how many descendants did he actually have? None. Nada. Zero. He was looking at having to give all that he had to a servant. God promised Abraham that you will have a child. And he will come from you and Sarah. And what did Abraham do? He believed. And God accounted it or imputed it to him as righteousness. Right? Paul's making a foundational statement here about salvation and how we are saved and the true believers in Christ. And that is, without faith, it is impossible to please God. That you have to believe that God is and that He's a rewarder of those that diligently seek Him. Amen? Amen. Amen. So in this verse, He brings you back to Abraham. And He tells you that Abraham believed God and it was accounted to him for righteousness. Now verse 4, now to him who works, the wages are not counted as grace, but as what? If you want to work for your righteousness, if you want to work for your salvation, then God owes you something. Can you ever work yourself in a right standing with God? No. Why? Almost all false religions, if not all, have one thing in common, and that is a works-based righteousness. That if, in the end, your good deeds outweigh your bad deeds, then God's going to accept you. But Paul, in chapters 1 and 2, what does he say about the whole human race? He says that we're bad. We're like really, really bad. And then he goes to the believers who actually claim a relationship with God. He says, you're bad 